It's, like, it's a good summer tradition. Ladies and gentlemen, how are we? I love it. It's all lying. I appreciate that, Bo. Thank you very much. It's like a panto crowd. I deeply appreciate it. Uh, my name is Chris uh, M.M. Gordon. I will be your host uh, for this next session. And I'm delighted to be able to say that because we are in such fabulous surroundings, but obviously such uh, a momentous place for so many lives and so many people and so many careers. And, and it's just a phenomenal thing to be able to bring something of the home of the Good Summit to the home of the Good Summit. Uh, to that end, we've got some incredible speakers lined up. Uh, we have one hour to be able to go through this, so uh, one of my main jobs is to keep you all on time. So I promise that we uh, may have started a little bit late, but we will end on time, if that is okay. And the final thing I would say is, if you do have a question, if there's something that you would like to ask, hopefully we'll have time at the end, please do uh, be aware of that. We will make sure that we pass them. Uh, anybody who's got a mobile phone, uh, there are people in other sessions who've heard me say this three or four times, but if you do have a mobile phone, please do turn it on silent. That would be great, uh, but do keep it out. Uh, take photographs and tweet, social media. Part of what we're trying to achieve with the Good Summit is not just for the people here, but for the people that are your followers or people outside of the room. This is not a conversation to be kept in the room. This is a conversation we want to blow the doors off. Not physically, sorry for anybody in Trinity. We do not want to physically blow the doors off. We do want to make sure that the message gets out. I know you all thought that was an amazing joke. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. You're, again, I love it. This crowd here, this section, I love it. You're, you're like my choir. I, I love it. We'll turn the lights on in a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to welcome the panel uh, about breaking boundaries in education, including the excluded. We've got prime examples of how lives can be changed uh, up here on stage. So please feel free to have your questions. We will be able to get around to them. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, because there's so many, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, so at this point, we'll just do a full roundup of who you all are and why you're here on stage, if you wouldn't mind. And then we'll go through the presentations that will be uh, about that topic. So, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know who's going to go first. Who wants to take the microphone? Oh, good stuff, Hugo. Hello, uh, my name is Hugo McNeil. I was in Trinity in the early 80s, and it's very different to what I see now. Some of the magical things that were there are still there. We just had a great session on Northern Ireland up there, and Northern Trinity was a place I could meet people from Northern Ireland to get to know them as friends and it is to this day. But I think what's really special, I don't, I don't think, I, mean, I haven't a recollection of Trinity being as inclusive um, as it is today, which I think is, 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 is the great story and look forward to sharing that with us. That's great. Thank you very much. Hugo. Hi, my name is Deirdre McAdams. I'm a former Trinity Access Program student and I'm currently doing my PhD here in chemistry and teaching on the Trinity Access Program as a staff member now. So Good. Look, can I ask? talking a bit about that too. What is the title of your chemistry PhD? You know? <laughs> I haven't got the title set down just yet. But I'm, I'm sure it'll it. change whether you hand it in <laughs> anyway. So that's excellent. Well done. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kathleen. I'm the deputy director in the Trinity Access Programs and touched down in Trinity in 1997, having done my undergraduate in the States. So I thought he was here for a year. So I'm in a time warp, <laughs> a Trinity time warp. <laughs> A year, okay, yeah. Hello, my name is Stephen Ryan, and I'm a uh, Trinity, um, I was on a course for intellectual disabilities, and I'm a graduate in, in January. Thank you. Congratulations. What topic was it? What did you... Um, Trinity Centre for Intellectual Disability. So there's a range of subjects, 21 modules over two years. Fantastic. You're going to be speaking about that? That is yeah, excellent. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thanks. Yeah, Michael Shovelin, I'm director of Trinity Centre for People with Intellectual Disabilities. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Okay, so the format, we are going to have some presentations. They're going to give you some information and obviously some personal stories. So we're not quite sure which order they're in. So we're going to kickstart with the Trinity Access. Good stuff. Let's do that. That'll be great. The mic is necessary, is it? Because I know we were up front, so we were getting the feedback. The mic is necessary, yes? Okay. okay. Oh, it's been recorded as well. Yes, pardon. good stuff. Okay. Do you want to stand up there, Kathy? Um, I'm going to start with this slide. Uh, so this, um, I suppose, as I mentioned, 1997, my story with TAP uh, started. And it started as I was walking down O'Connell Street with my then lecturer from the School of Education in Trinity. And she had just uh, supervised an English class, which I had given. And as we were walking down O'Connell Street, she invited me to volunteer with TAP. 
and I was absolutely delighted. So um, that was the beginning of my story, but I suppose it goes back much further. It goes back to the woman that you see in this picture, who, if um, you couldn't tell, is my mother. She um, grew up in the West Kerry Gaeltacht, and uh, this picture was taken in the early 50s. Um, she was number nine in a family of 14, so a large family, which wasn't uncommon, um, but they were quite uh, poor. Uh, and un uneducated, and she would often talk about uh, stories where she, she and her brother would walk over the fields to school with their obligatory um, piece of turf or fuel to provide, and she'd sometimes be turned away from the school gate because they quite simply didn't have those resources. Um, but I suppose uh, armed with that, she emigrated to the United States and uh, and made a good life for herself there. And I suppose the one thing that this indomitable Kerry woman gave me was, you know, a, a love for education and uh, a knowledge of the value of education. And I suppose from a TAP perspective as well, um, if you wouldn't mind, we just might move on to the next slide. Um, we owe a debt of gratitude to some of the, the founders of the access programs. Um, so there were some very forward-thinking um, individuals and um, people like Susan Parks, who was a historian in the School of Education, and P.J. Drudy, who uh, quite remarkably, after founding TAP, went on to spearhead the Trinity Center for People with Intellectual Disabilities as well. And we, we, uh, quite, uh, we owe so much to those people who are very progressive and very courageous because, as, as Hugo alluded to, um, Trinity in the 90s was a very different place. Um, I dug out a press release from the archives which um, of the early 90s where the students' union had said, you know, that the composition of the students' body was seriously imbalanced. And they said that that situation, you know, was neither acceptable or inevitable. And people like PJ and Susan and many others went, went about changing this. And they made a really bold statement um, to, uh, to our local community, you know, that, that Trinity didn't need to be that so-called posh or elite place that people walked around. It could become that place that people were not afraid of, but they walked conf confidently through the front arch. And it could become a place where they saw their educational dreams unfolding. And, uh, you know, that it could become part of their story, their home away from home. And um, so it was from that essence that TAP was born. And a partnership with seven local schools started in 1993. And... Um, there were seven students. Some of the first activities in that first year were quite simple, but yet profound. Seven students were given seven desks for a quiet place to study where they could start to begin, you know, to prepare for um, their college education. And um, other students, and you can see the photograph behind me as well, hopefully, yes, other students the, in the black and white photo um, participated in a summer program, and they had a chance to interact with such amazing lecturers like Brendan Kennelly, who was, you know, always giving of his time to tap. Um, and then we had three students who came in, and they became the first access students in Trinity. And they were, you know, pioneers, really, at this time. And they were accepted by three departments. Psychology, business, and law accepted these students who hadn't matriculated for Trinity. And all eyes were on them. All eyes were on these students. You know, would they blaze a trail? Or we had critics at the time who were saying, you're setting these students up for failure. Would they crash and burn? Thankfully, they blazed a trail. So just move on to the next slide. Um, so before long, TAP was, you know, growing strategically. It was gaining momentum, and there was significant growth in the number of our activities, the types of partnerships that we had. And I suppose you can see, you know, our current work represented in this diagram. And, oh, I beg your pardon there. Um, was there? Yes, thank you. In this wheel, okay. So we, we offer a continuum of supports, you know, bring, beginning at primary school and moving, you know, all the way through um, all arenas of the education sector up through adult education. And um, we also offer university access courses, so preparatory courses and alternative entry routes. Personal, financial and social supports are provided to all access entrants who enter the university. Um, and I beg your pardon, I have some notes here as well. I was, I was working late at a careers fair for Trinity last night, so I didn't have time to fully memorize this. Beg your pardon. And, 
And, and, but we also run professional development courses for educators. And quite importantly, all of our work is underpinned by um, a, you know, a research and evaluation. But I suppose when I think about TAP and I think about the 22 years that I've had the, the, the fortune of, of being involved with the organization, I suppose the golden thread really is that it's people-centered, okay? And that our work has been supported by Trinity at all levels. Um, I know many people are involved with the Good Summit. So people like Luke O'Neill, you know, give generously of their time and their skills. You know, he delivers um, workshops for students all the time. And, and he's not alone. Um, we have uh, lecturers from the School of English who help young children to craft books that go on to be displayed in the long room. Um, we have alumni who make generous scholarship donations to help students who are experiencing acute financial hardship. Um, we also have catering staff who've set up, uh, um, you know, uh, free lunches, in fact, for students that are living in care and students that are in direct provision. Uh, we have our undergraduate students that head out to their schools as mentors. And these are only really a handful of, uh, of activities that, um, that we see the whole, Trinity, the whole of Trinity engaging in to help um, support the work of the access programs. And I suppose it is this positive human endeavor that has you know, allowed for us to include more of the formally excluded. Um, and our numbers start to speak for themselves, but uh, it's always important to remember that you know, numbers uh, represent, certainly the numbers in TAP, they represent real lives and real experiences. So you can see here those original three access students that I spoke about, you know, you do reach that tipping point. We have welcomed 3,000 students through alternative entry routes, in including um, mature students. And, and all of these students are low income and first generation from their families to pursue a university education. And th that handful of participants in the outreach activities has grown to an annual intake of 5,700 students who get to experience, you know, the treasures of Trinity College and get a taste of what it might be like to be a, a, a student here. Um, and then we've had 458 teachers who have been involved in the prof continuous professional development um, programs, and they now are impacting the schools and the communities that they're working in and positively influencing those DESH schools. So Trinity has now entered into a new phase, and uh, Trinity Access Programs, and thank you. So I'm just going to give two examples and, and then start to wind down so that I can hand over the mic here, of how our strategic work is growing both nationally and internationally. Um, it was fitting that the provost uh, launched the Good Summit this morning and he spoke about community and connections, um, which is what we're all about. So delighted to hear that that's part of the, the next st strategic phase and strategic plan for the university. Our foundation course um, has had 700 graduates since, since its inception in 1999. And back in 2015, um, the principal of Lady Margaret Hall in Oxford was sharing a pint with um, our provost in the stag's head. And uh, over their, their first or second pint anyway, the provost um, and, and this chance encounter, I suppose, the provost gave him a bit of a nudge and said, why don't you start doing what TAP is doing? And uh, they then set out and embarked on setting up their own foundation course, modeled on the TAP foundation course. And my colleague, Kleena Hannon, has um, brought that export um, over there, and it's been a huge success, so much so that other colleges in Oxford and indeed Cambridge will be modeling that foundation program. So you can, activities that start small and quite local can become international, um, even over a pint in the stag's head. And then another example um, that I'll give, the second example is the College Awareness Week campaign. And again, that started as a very small outreach activity involving 250 local primary school children who are working in their schools on, on daily activities. There's a resource book which local primary school teachers helped us to put together, um, helping to tease out um, you know, about the differences between primary school and college and some of the advantages of continuing your education for as long as possible. Um, and this would culminate in a graduation program in Trinity. But I suppose we wanted to take this concept to scale and help for it to be publicly accessible and something that um, carried a simple message. And we found that way. So we set up a national campaign. It's collegeaware.ie. And last year, there were 1,600 events logged on this website, 
150,000 people logging in using the free publicly accessible um, materials that are hosted by this platform. Currently in Ireland, one in three second level schools have logged events and 57% of all DESH schools are part of this campaign. And the message is quite simple, that having a post-secondary plan is import in, important and doable, you know? So a very simple message. And that campaign will run from the 17th to the 23rd of November. Everyone can be a part of it. I liked what Jim Breen said, you know, there's a community of half a million people who are currently involved with the higher education sector, mainly undergraduate students and staff. What's stopping us to take some of our learning and our experiences, return to our communities, whether it's your local library, your former school, and share some of your positive messages about education and the value of education. So I suppose I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, myself and my colleagues in TAP, it's our good privilege to do uh, this good work and to have the opportunity to interact with so many remarkable staff and students and to share the resources of this amazing university um, with our wider community. We do feel a deep sense of responsibility to our future students who deserve a world-class Trinity education because they feel that Trinity is the place where they'll be able to uh, become the best possible version of themselves. Uh, but we're also acutely aware there's so many challenges left, and they, those have been alluded to throughout this morning. Um, although university progression rates um, in Ireland, they rank very favorably across the OECD, um, but we're only too familiar that so many households and communities in Ireland continue to face some very severe economic, social, and educational barriers. So Trinity very much so needs to continue to do its part make its mark and contribute in a, in, in a meaningful way to reducing these educational inequalities. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Kathleen. I appreciate it. Well done. Now, I believe, is it Deirdre? Who's next? Okay. Is that right? Yeah. Good stuff. Great. Thank you. Um, so I suppose I was very delighted when I was asked to come here today. And what I want to kind of speak about is sort of my revolving door experience from when I was first included into Trinity. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to touch on that today, um, remarking on a couple of remarkable people that helped me along that journey. Um, yesterday, in fact, I was invited as a past TAP ambassador to an event um, with the CEO of LinkedIn. Um, and he came, he came over and it was sort of a bit of an ad hoc meeting. It was, I think, I believe, just to put in the works from the last week um, but he came and he had a huge interest in our students and he came and he said look I don't want to meet with all the academics you know I know you're a world-class institution I want to meet your students so that was brilliant and we went to quite an informal Q&A session with him which was amazing you know one of these experiences that you would never dream of you know coming before you enter an institution like Trinity but he spoke briefly before he opened the questions up to the floor and he spoke about the importance of networking and the importance of building and expanding your social circle from a young age, something that he done and only really realized um, the importance of it when he kind of climbed that social mobility ladder and went to the top of and became the CEO of, of a company like LinkedIn. But what was remarkable was that he talked about them shying away from using the term networking for such a long time. They kind of pictured it as this one particular class of person sitting around in a nice, nicely laced suit, speaking with other people of the same affluent social class as themselves and sort of sharing business cards. And that was the idea around networking for a long time. And I think in some cases it still is, but I think what got us to where we are today here at the Good Summit and why we know each other and our familiarities with each other is because of our networking abilities. And I think it's very important for us to keep in mind that we need to grow our social circle in that sense and include people who wouldn't necessarily be in our primary or immediate network um, from, from the get-go. So I think that that's something that has really helped me become where I am today and that's something that I kind of keep in mind um, a lot when I'm trying to help some people out um, now that I'm in a privileged position that I am. Um, so I suppose sticking to the theme of including the excluded, I mean I was excluded from the campus before I, I came here. I applied to Trinity through CAO the way 
many people, the majority of the entrants that come in here to get their bachelor degree um, do. And in my school, where I went to the Assumption Secondary School in Walkinson, which was a great school, but nobody in my school was achieving over 500 Leaving Certificate points, which meant fundamentally that everybody in my school was excluded for, from traditional entry into Trinity. Um, I came from uh, Ballyfermot, which was an area that 7% of students in the year that I went on to further education actually progressed on to any form of further education. So it's like a tiny minority, a really small number. And I suppose it was TAP that looked at that issue and said, why is this happening? You know, this is not an intelligence measure. This is not a, a true representative of how smart people are, and if that's the basis of which we're accepting people at Trinity, then why are we getting everybody from one area? And it's a great question. I'm delighted that they asked the question, because otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, so I remember hearing about the foundation course when I was in my fifth year, and I said, you know, this is it. This is the course for me. I'd love to go to Trinity, but I know I'm not going to get the Leaving Certificate points to get in. I'm not too sure what it is necessarily that I want to study, but I know I love chemistry, I love science. I said, so this foundation course that Kathleen alluded to earlier um, would be brilliant for me, is what I thought. Um, so luckily I applied and I was accepted and I went on to this one-year foundation program and I studied the science stream. And I performed very well and when I got there initially I said, I want to be a pharmacist. This is me, a pharmacist in the make and I can't wait, I love chemistry. And I suppose the first real role model that I met was my chemistry tutor on the foundation program. His name was Porg Nagel, and he had this sort of infectious love of chemistry. He just, there was this massive smile on his face all the time, just loved teaching, was so enthusiastic about the subject. And I caught this chemistry bug, you know, I, I got that love for chemistry that he had too. And he says, Deirdre, what are you going to go on to do? You know, you have a real gift for chemistry. And I says, I know, I says, I love it, I'm going to be a pharmacist. He says, no. He says, Deirdre, don't become a pharmacist. He says, you love chemistry way too much to become a pharmacist, you know. <laughs> he says, you really, he says, why don't you research medicinal chemistry? as a degree program and come back to me and tell me what you think. And I had never even heard of medicinal chemistry before. I didn't know it was a subject you could study or that, or I thought it was just analogous to pharmacy, a, di a different term used. So I went back anyway and I said, Paul, you know what, you're right. I said, medicinal chemistry is going to be the course for me. And he says, right, well, you think that now. He says, but I'll tell you what, I'm in the finishing stages of my PhD and I've just secured a postdoctorate position up in Dundalk IT. And he said, and I could really do with a hand in the lab throughout the summer. So. He says, I can't pay it or anything like that, but if you want to get some experience, you can come up to Dundalk IT with me and I'll give you a little project to work on, you know. He said, because fundamentally that's what you'll be doing, so you want to make sure you're really that into it, you know. So I says, right. So I went up and that was a wonderful summer. And, you know, I was going into first year then knowing I am doing the course that's meant for me. You know, I knew it on so many different levels because of the lifelines that I was th thrown just from, from coming into TAP, you know. So I went on anyway. I did my degree in medicinal chemistry and it was brilliant. Um, I became TAP's first scholar, which was amazing. Like I, I was encouraged throughout my undergraduate degree to go for these exams uh, by Sarah and Kathleen and many other people that I had uh, you know, formed these great personal relationships with in TAP. Um, so that was another really milestone in my kind of timeline of being here that I wouldn't have gone for. I, you know, why would I? You know, I, I was neglected or I would have been, you know, I wouldn't have been accepted the first time. What would, that would be notions of me to go on and sit those exams, you know, but because of the encouragement um, from the central staff members, I did it and I achieved it. And then, I mean, it's just, it's an amazing experience to find this. Um, Sarah, who is the foundation course coordinator, actually, when I finished the foundation course, she turned to me and she said, Deirdre, you'd make a great volunteer. And I've already passed on your email address and details to Kathleen, and she's going to get you involved in some programs now that you're going in as a student. So I said, it's great. And it's just, you know, when one door opens, it's just, you know, you see the, the passage after that. Kathleen got me involved then in um, a volunteering program with the Bookmarks event, which you also briefly mentioned there. And that's where um, I got involved with volunteering with the primary school. Um, cohort of students that we bring in here and one day Kathleen said Deirdre will you help me out on campus we have I think 150 little Draculas coming in <laughs> around Halloween <laughs> so we had 150 primary school students come in all dressed up as Dracula and we focused the day on Bram Stoker, Stoker. yeah it was That's in honor of Bram Stoker that's right and um, there was a chemistry professor that came and volunteered his time to talk to these primary school students about why blood is red 
that was Professor Matthias Senge, who I ended up meeting with. And I said, Kathleen, will you pass on my details to him? I would love to do a little internship with him during the summer. And you did. And I went on to do the internship, get a part-time job with him throughout my undergraduate experience. And he's a great mentor and friend of mine now that I'm doing my PhD in the same department. So, I mean, it just kind of goes to show the importance of including the traditionally excluded because you just don't know and another thing that was I was very humbled by was when I began my PhD last year there was a research assistant there and he said dear do you don't remember me do you he sort of came up to me while I was in the lab and I said oh no I don't I'm sorry why I said how are you doing you know are you working with us and he says yeah he says you came to my school to give a talk when I was in fifth year and you, you talked about the access program and what you were going in to study and all this sort of stuff and that was the first day I began studying, when I was in secondary school. He says, I need to pull up my socks here because I want to do this. He's now off doing a PhD in Australia, you know, and it's amazing. So I suppose the point that I'll get at and that I'll finish at is just that you can do all these remarkable things for people where I think we're all reading for the same, from the same book when we say we want to, you know, include people and do nice things for people and show acts of kindness. And most of the time that will go unnoticed to you and hopefully you won't see the, the fruits of that labor for a long time but sometimes one person will just turn around to you and say you did this for me and it's just it just goes to show you don't know the half of what really happens and goes on behind the scenes but sometimes you catch a glimpse of it and it's really nice so to include the excluded I think is a, a, a great thing that we can all try that, to do yeah. that is yeah. awesome ladies and gentlemen round of applause for Deirdre I am also fascinated about why blood is red that is now in my head also, I thank you very much to Kathleen as well about the idea of going into the stag's head for something that can happen that'll be good. That's never happened in my experience, but it's always good to know. I'm also a little bit torn. We're about halfway through, so just to keep that in reminders for our speakers. Uh, and we're looking forward to uh, hearing from them all, but just bear in mind we're about halfway through. Uh, Stephen, you ready? Hello. Good stuff. Um, yeah, so like I said, I'm, I'm a Trinity graduate um, graduating in January. So I'm going to share with you today my story of what led me up till now. Right. This is my story. Right. My background. Well, I come from Balakmyla, a small village in County Leash. I never fitted in at school because of my disability. I developed at a different rate to other children. So I found it hard to catch up with the work. I was alone for two years without education or a job before I started in Trinity College. This was a very low point in my life. Right. Um, my family. If it wasn't for the support of my family, I wouldn't be where I am today. My aunt works in Trinity, and she knew my mom and I was trying to find something. So she contacted us straight away when she found out about the course. Getting into tr Trinity was when my life truly started getting better. My interests. Well, my main interest is watching movies, as I am a big movie buff. Um, I love playing and watching soccer. Um, I also like playing my PS4 to, that should be unwind, rewind, <laughs> that's just uh, after a long day. <laughs> right, my time at Trinity College, Dublin. Right. Well, on the course, over the two years, I studied 21 modules. I got 21 distinctions. I am thrilled with this, as I never felt good enough for school, so to get this in Trinity College Dublin was amazing. It taught me that when you, times seem tough, you can soldier to and succeed, which I did. Um, this course gives people with disabilities a route into work. And I think that's amazing, as most people with disabilities think they'll never work. Um, we as Trusen thank you all for giving us this, this, uh, this opportunity to show what we can do and achieve. And I think this is very rewarding. When people think disability, they think of someone who will never work or someone who will belong in the daycare center. But with your help, we can change the way people think of us for the future. Right. Um, one of my favorite subjects on the course was disability rights. Um, it gives, I, and this is why, um, it gives students with the rights so they can fight for them. 
give students so they know their rights. It taught me what I am entitled to as a person with a disability and what we're not getting in society today. Um, the class was taught by a person with a disability, which I thought was great, to have a lecturer who been through the same as us and understands where we are coming from. We learned more about the UNCRPD, which stands for Universal Convention of Rights for Persons with Disabilities. We originally heard from this in OT class, which stands for Occupational Therapy. And challenges. Well, at first I found the commuting from Carlo really hard to get used to as I was always very tired in the evenings. I remember when I first started Trinity and um, while I was reading the handbook, the one thing I remember thinking on how on earth was I ever going to do this was the 10 minute presentations as I was never good at getting up in front of crowds. But look at me, I am talking to you. <laughs> While in college, one of the classes I had real difficulty with was with our sign language. As with my dyspraxia, it was hard for me to get you into the right position. What would make things um, harder, the lecturer was deaf and she taught sign language through sign language. But what made things easier that she wrote on the board. So, um, I have dyspraxia, which is a movement and coordination dif dif disability, and it means that it ha it's harder for me to work my body and to get my fingers into the right positions, which found it very difficult for sign language. The truth is that I never dreamt I would be good for enough for Trinity, to study in Trinity. I found it a challenge at first to get my arid head around that I do belong here in Trinity College. Right. What I learned at Trinity, Trinity taught me how to be more independent. It taught me how to be more comfortable while talking in front of crowds. Again, I'm here. Um, I learned out about different parts of Dublin, so I am not as scared as I once was on coming to Dublin. My graduate internship. At the end of the course, um, I did a graduate internship, and this is the, where I did it. My graduate internship was in a place called, I did my work experience, EY, Ernest & Young, located on Harcourt Street, Dublin. I was working in the FSO tax section of EY, which I really enjoyed. They started me off with basic stuff like photocopying and scanning. As the weeks went on, it got more challenging, but it was a challenge I loved. Towards the end of the internship, I didn't want to go, but it turned out I didn't have to. On my birthday, the 19th of August 2019, I was told I was made permanent in EY. I die, I will never forget, as I finally found a place that wanted me. So, the girl. Uh, the girl on this side is um, uh, Neve Parsons. She was my body. But in my experience in EY, I have multiple bodies because they're all willing to help each other. The other lad um, is my boss. And he mightn't like making me permanent because um, we're going for dinner after on his credit card. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> My goals for the future. I would like to go on holiday with my friends for Special Olympics. I would also like to see a Man United match at Old Trafford, but maybe not at the moment, they're not playing so great. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that, I don't have any plans for the future, but I cannot wait for, to find out what it holds for me. Now that I have a substantial income, thanks to EY, I can afford to plan for the future, like moving out and living an independent life. Thanks for listening. That's incredible. Absolutely phenomenal. And uh, you got me well enough, Stephen. This is brilliant. Congratulations. Well done. That is truly brilliant. Your greatest achievement getting that dinner from EY. I thought that was... Well done, well done. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so excellent. Uh, I believe we are in the last two, so uh, Michael, are you next? Yeah, well, I had, I had a presentation ready, but I don't know if I even need to give it after the previous speech. And they said it all. Um, I suppose the whole idea of expanding horizons was something that 
some of the young people who work with us, uh, who come into the center, this was what they believed, and that their horizons were very low. That often it was presumed they were going to go to a day service, um, that their lives were going to be very circumscribed, very limited. And I suppose that's the biggest thing in a way that, and I think very much what Deirdre and Kathleen have been saying, and Stephen, is about Trinity College offering another option, another way of thinking. And I think that's what good higher education and good universities should be about, is thinking differently. And myself and Kathleen were talking at the last talk when people were talking about empathy. Now, we weren't talking when the other speakers were speaking, obviously. But the idea that there isn't much empathy among the adult population, I find really a very tenuous thing to say. I think there is enormous empathy. I think there is enormous goodness there. Part of the difficulty is sometimes harnessing it, or sometimes the systems we work within don't allow us. I am immensely privileged. I've spent something like 30 years in this whole area of inclusive education, and this is a wonderful day to hear this young man speaking about his life and about what difference he is going to make to other people, not just to himself. And I just think that it's all about harnessing these uh, ideas, believing in people, not making assumptions that because they have a certain difficulty, they are not going to want or be able to achieve exactly the same as everybody else and what everybody else wants to be. Um, and I think that is the key thing really about the center and what we're trying to do as a center. And we, it's always about really, it's about very, very basic things often that we take for granted. And I thought what Stephen said, he found a place that he finally belonged, that wanted him. And it's not what we all want. It's not what we all need. And it's about what does it mean to be truly human. And I think that is really what the work that so many people do, and often it's very, uh, it isn't always visible, but it's there. And I think we just need to really recognize that and try and build it in ways. For these young people uh, in schools, often there was a lot of good work done. But often it was very, very limited because they didn't see a future. The ambition for these young people was often very, very limited because of the type of society. We set up certain structures that we believe work, and they work for the normal. Now, if you've ever seen a normal person anywhere, let me know. I'd love to meet them. But there is this norm, and we set up systems then that really say, you belong here, and then this is the path you follow. And for people who are... Uh, I suppose, on the receiving end of whether it's social welfare or whether it's special education or whatever, they get very few choices because the paths are already predetermined, even if there aren't any. And often there are very, very few. And that's really what we've been trying to do with support from people like Deirdre Martel, Social Innovation, with Hugo here, with our business partners who have made an enormous difference because they believe in the young people that go to them. And we can't anticipate at all what they're going to be doing. We have young people operating software systems. We have other people doing all kinds of work that we would never have anticipated. And I think that's where the good news story is. That's the core about belonging, about being needed, about having a value and making a contribution. Thank you. Thank you for us, Michael. Well, as I said at the outset, one of my proudest things is being an ambassador for the Trinity Center, and, it, and it's been phenomenal. And I only came across it by accident a number of years ago when I was at an Ireland Funds event uh, at Chartered Accountants Ireland, and some of the students were actually speaking. And I heard students like Stephen, before Stephen's time, talk about how their lives had been transformed. I heard their parents talk about how the lives of the family had been transformed because someone like Stephen was now not sitting on the edge of things, but telling everybody about the, the dinner table about what, what they had done. And I heard from the companies how saying had they had been transformed and the impact that the young people had made. David McRedmond was one of our partners who runs on post, so that's a civilizing sort of influence. And we've sort of seen the potential that, 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 that 
that they have have been unleashed. And, you know, Stephen, that was just absolutely fantastic, uh, you know, today. But one of the things that I also saw was the importance of educate, of employment, of putting people into jobs. In addition to sort of Stephen, I can think of some great other examples of his colleagues who are, who are flourishing. But I remember coming right across the, uh, the, 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 the front square to a graduation ceremony a few years ago. And the people from the center were, everybody was there in their gowns, but they were a little bit worried about one girl. We'll call her Mary. Mary wasn't her name. What was the problem? Mary, when she came out of this course, this great course that Michael and all the colleagues who were down here had put together, had nowhere to go in terms of employment. So she went back to her care provider, which was, but they looked after the elderly ladies with Alzheimer's. So Mary, unfortunately, the path had actually just, the progress had unwound. And she was just going to have to walk from here, really halfway down the, the aisle to pick up her certificate. Now we've seen what Stephen have done, we've seen what so many of them have come. At the end of the thing, she couldn't walk from here to there and pick up her certificate. She sat there, she was clearly distressed, her family were crushed. And so we said after that, everybody we take and come through the course, we're going to work with and, and place. And through the great work of Marie Devitt and the team, we were the pathways to work. We're now placing all our students, and also in a benefit to the companies. We've gone from four business partners, we've gone to now to 27. We're having 12 other live discussions. The potential of this is huge, because in a great report that launched this week by Minister Mary, Mary Mitchell O'Connor, that Michael and Des Aston and the team had put together, it said that 84 people, 84 with intellectual disabilities, were registered in third level education, out of a total on disability services of 57,000. That's less, a fraction of 1%. So the great news is, with through ambassadors, through examples of people like Stephen, we are absolutely determined that that's going to change. That is not good enough for, t for, for today. That isn't, we need to encourage, and Trinity is leading the way around the, around the island. There's other educational institutions that are doing a version. We can help and support that. Every company that we've had one of our students, nobody has had a bad example. So we're going to continue to go out to companies uh, to spread the word and with great excitement. And the great thing is that we're taking this extraordinary story, the story of Stephen and others, way beyond the walls of Trinity, out into the communities around the country. And in something that through the excellence of Michael is, is world class, this is world class leading in terms of the, uh, the capabilities. And we're so excited. I say to Jennifer, my wife, every day I have an interaction with the center and the students and the staff is a good day. And to conclude with the sort of, you talked earlier about Brendan Kennelly. And Brendan, I did the course, with, I studied with Brendan when I was here, he became a great friend. But Brendan, who is somebody who has a great view of the excluded and the people in margins of society of every kind. And Brendan's description of the center uh, is still the best description that I've ever heard. He said, when I look at the work that is done, the mask of disability is removed to reveal the extraordinary ability that lies beneath. And Stephen has given us a brilliant example of that extraordinary ability that lies beneath. And the challenge for all of us is to take this and multiply it. And really doing that will really make Ireland the island of opportunity for all its citizens. Thanks very much. Excuse my little sneeze there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Hugo, uh, ladies and gentlemen, who here has a question? Is there any question that people got for the panel? Yes. Uh, would you mind saying your name and uh, just uh, your question? Thank you. Um, my, na my name is Ken McHugh. I'm a, I'm a cultural planner with Sport Against Racism. Uh, when I was a kid, I was actually barred from coming into this uh, place because I was a, a Christian, the Roman, the Roman Catholic. So the Archbishop of Dublin, uh, under pain of sin, barred me from coming in here. But I defied them, and I defied the future bishops, and eventually they, they declared me, um, they excommunicated me, and then eventually declared me an atheist. And I'm just wondering about the man up there, the Palestinian refugee, if he was coming to Dublin, he'd be, probably go to Larkin College, which I'm very familiar with, and because he'd have a stamp tree, um, which is a visa, stamp tree visa, he wouldn't have direct access into Trinity College, he would have to do a PLC course. And up the top of the street is Belvedere College, and 100% of the students usually go on to the third level up there. So it's a huge, you know, this is an institutional barrier. 
it's really important that TAP fight that. You know, fight the, the it's it's great that, that you're doing work and I'm, I'm very proud of that. But you need to fight the, the institutional uh, barrier that's preventing young kids, young Palestinians who come here from getting into a uh, total level. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a good point. I don't know if there's a, a, a cultural element to this, which might be just relevant. The, the microphone's there in front of you there, Kathleen. It's certainly not to suggest that we've uh, found that solution. Um, thankfully, all of the universities are coming together and establishing universities of sanctuary, and uh, Trinity is involved in that as well. So we hope that there will be more of a, a holistic approach, both from the point of view of admissions and then support for students who are asylum seekers and refugees through their whole undergraduate educational experience. But I completely agree that, um, you know, that, that a lot more could be done in this area, There's, you know, unquestionably. And uh, so we have initiated um, a scholarship program, but it's, you know, for a small number of students. But I'd like to think that we will, as we have with our other activities, gain momentum. Uh, so those four scholarships will start to grow exponentially so that they genuinely address the need that's out there. Great question. Thank you very much. Got another question here. Do you mind saying your name before you uh, ask? Yeah, Colin Ross School of Education, Trinity College. Uh, it's great stories uh, and wonderful TAP is doing wonderful work. Uh, and it's great that it's been replicated in the UK and, and uh, US. But I just came back from Vietnam, 21 years working in education in Vietnam. And in the developing world, I think there's a great need for, you know, in, in, interventions like TAP, much more than, than in the developed world. And it would be great if if Trinity could work together with Irish Aid to promote TAP uh, to countries where Irish Aid is working. Because the, uh, Irish Aid and education, uh, education in Ireland, they promote all the, the very academic idea of education in Ireland, and not so much some, the inclusiveness uh, and the access uh, and the, the models that are here. And I think that you know, there's a great possibility to replicate TAP, not only in the blue chip universities, but also in the very underprivileged universities uh, that get very little support in relation to uh, promoting access. Thank you. Yeah, good stuff. Anybody want to respond to that? Maybe. What can I say? I think that's an excellent suggestion, and I think that we can bring it back to the widening participation community, and I, I think that it's both for replication of TCPID and TAP because, um, you know, I think that you're right in saying that there's quite a lot that we take for granted in terms of our progression from primary to second level and then, you know, the high progression rates in Ireland to both further education and training and higher education and, uh, you know, certainly even moving from primary to second level, there's quite a lot that we can share in terms of some of the success stories in Ireland, you know, with Irish Aid and other organizations. In a small way, we're trying to plug our students in and to create opportunities, um, leadership opportunities, and opportunities for them to share their positive educational experiences through um, intercultural exchange organizations that have offered scholarships to access students. So that's one small endeavor. So there is a template there, but we'll, uh, hopefully we can pick up this conversation and move it forward, and, and some of my p other panelists might like to add to, to that. Yeah, just to kind of think the point, even even sort of closer to home. When when we think we have twenty students who are now, you know, and it's it's transforming the lives of as we've mentioned, and we've sort of expanded the capacity because of the great job the team is doing. As we mentioned, we're well aware that that's only a small fraction of the people with intellectual disabilities around the country. I mean, the number of there is a number of others, ten others, ten in total, ten other you know institutions who do some form of what what what's done here. But well, that's reduced. It's been three, four have have, have 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 stopped in the last in the last few years, and we've kind of shown the model. I mean, this, the, the if the, the key core elements is having the educational excellence and the thing, and then as we've seen, placing the jobs, we've got to balance the the amount. We're only scratching the very surface of the amount of jobs of companies. Our ambition: every ask every company of a certain size and and public sector, and was can you take on somebody, and so the capacity for actually them responding through the great examples we have is huge. But we're going to need, you know, we don't have a centre, there's not a centre in UCD, there isn't really in DCU. I mean, in, in, in the capital, we have, we have people travelling, as you would with your child, from all over the country um, to come here. And so there's, I think, a great potential, both in Trinity, for Trinity doing the excellence of what's currently being done, expanding, 
you know, carefully within the sort of the confines of the Trinity program, but a huge potential out for the rest of the for the rest of the country in, in, in actually making this scaling this you know in in, 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 in a huge way. So so a lot done with uh, obviously there's there's more opportunities to expand in the future. Yes. Uh, thank you. It's just following on from the point, uh, my name is Caroline, I've worked for Enable Ireland, which is a physical disability, and what we were seeing coming through our caseload was a stream of, of children who were within the normal spectrum of, of, disabil of, of intellectual, but they were presenting with coordination and sensory issues. And what we designed was an accredited course so that teachers and SN teachers would, would, um, would work with the kids to, to prepare and, and, and help them through the, the stages of life. As, as education got harder, so they had a, the client had a sensory uh, diet, and the teachers were then trained to uh, acknowledge and identify what was happening in the class. So if the child stood up and, and started doing bench presses, that was a way of kind of centering themselves. Where I suppose a generation ago you got slapped and you came back into the body. But I suppose my question really, and it, and it's, it speaks to kind of incurable curiosity, is there are. You don't have to go so far to find out that the Trinity Access Programme is desperately needed in areas such as the Western Seaboard, where colleges on that, on that area have no knowledge of or understanding of, of, a, of a child going into education or what that looks like. And if you go deeper, you look at what, what is in the population. So agriculturally, you will hear amongst farmers, they will talk about families who have beef or have cattle or those who can mind dairy. If you have a dairy herd, you have ADHD because you're constantly watching things. You're constantly tipping and tapping. Whereas if you have a, a, a beef herd, you are literally just moving them from field to field. So that kind of neurodiversity is is identified within within that kind of province, provincial area. But when it comes when those children come into the education system, they disappear because we educate in straight lines with, with, without the, the supports that T Trinity Access provide. So, I'm so, my, so my short question is, is it scalable through the Irish system? And if that is the case, then, that, then it will diverse, it'll dilute across because, I mean, because we have such an ability to travel. Yes. No, I, absolutely. The thrust of the question there, are you okay? You clear? Scalability and the chat—that's uh, uh, a good point. But the, the 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 other thing as well is I love the fact that you get questions about Trinity Access Program. It's all related to you're not doing enough. It's like, as in you know, like your thing is perfectly working for the people that it serves. How can we make sure it's scaled? I like that. Uh, I'm de I'm delighted to walk away with a to-do list. I'm always giving one good. to my husband. Yeah, you're, so you're doing <laughs> this well. is my comeuppance. And um, yeah, I suppose one of the the benefits and, and, and earlier speakers uh, suggested that you know you might um, you might get someplace faster if you're going there on your own and you get further if you do it together. So I suppose my experience over the last 20 some odd years has been that we've had a, a really productive and collaborative uh, relationship with all of the higher education institutions and indeed the further education and training sector in Ireland and I suppose that's the beauty of, of um, Ireland you know it's great communicators and there is you know a deep sense of of community so you can wrap your your hands around um, the country and get things done um, and we have been able to do that through access provision and we've worked you know we've we've worked well together um, so that would include partnerships with Sligo and with Galway and so for instance the higher education access route and the disability access route to education started off as very small localized very confusing uh, application procedures for students because you could be submitting applications to multiple different HEIs and we were able to say look let's make this student-centered and work together reach agreement and consensus on the criteria for entry. And Kathleen, and is that college aware? What's the... No, so that's the, the um, access college or the higher education access route and the disability access route to education sure. are, is an alternative entry route for students. And how is it that? Can you give us a sense of like how easy is it now to be able to branch out and do that single form and... 
Very easy. So it's all embedded within the CAO, and there's 30,000 plus applications that students submit. It's a it's an ancillary form. It's a supplementary form uh, attached to the CAO, so it's pushed out to students. And there are systems changes that can be really helpful, even if we consider further education and training. If that is you know brought closer and aligned more closely with the CAO, there's fantastic opportunities for students at community level. No student should be like Steve even in your home for several years, feeling that you have uh, no place to go or nothing to do. There, ha there is something for everyone that will align with your skills, your aptitudes and abilities. And we need to really shake up our communities so that people are, you know, connected, you know, as much as possible and that we overcome any issues, whether that be in relation to transport or access or, you know, whatever barriers they and, may be experiencing. And so there are solutions to some of the, the design thinking. I think that's quite, that's to your point as well. How do we start getting across over the problems and the barriers that we're facing? And one of those is that people just don't know to even apply. I mean, it's stressful enough that time of year anyway, or it, those we, that time in your life. We can never, and I don't know, I'm sure, I'd, and I'd like to hand this, Deirdre yeah, sure. might speak to this, but um, information yeah. and guidance is so important. And, you know, we take for granted. So, so many of us are, are armed with those networks and that information and guidance. But but for so many others, it's, it's hard to reach that, whether it is because of literacy issues um, or that they're just not in the know. So we, you know, it's important to simplify. And as somebody said earlier, to walk around in the shoes of another individual, really try and think about it from the perspective yeah. of that person. Good. Deirdre, can I just paraphrase maybe something? You had access, you had opportunities, you were in uh, D12, uh, not D12, where? went to school in Dublin 12, yeah, yeah. but I'm from Ballyferm at Dublin 10. Great, yeah, and so there were opportunities and all that sort of stuff, but there weren't this type of opportunities. You said the people weren't thinking about Trinity, for example. I mean, can you give me a sense of what that is like and maybe what the this overcomes? Yeah, I mean, I, I had a conversation with Donald McLachlan-Byrne, who was the SU president at one stage during my undergraduate experience here, and we compared, it actually featured in an Irish Times article at the time, but we compared our secondary school experiences. And he went to Gonzaga, 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 Gonzaga College. Yeah. Shows how much I know of it. He was, he was the first time I heard of the college. Yeah, and so he went there and he said it wasn't a question of will I go to college or will my peer group co go to college. It was where will we go to college? Will we go down to Cork? Will we stay here in Trinity? Will we go over to UCD? That wasn't the question, you know. It was a normal thing for them to do to go and get grinds after school. You know, they were in school, extra hours, getting the extracurricular support that they needed so that they could ask themselves and their peer group that question, what university will we go to? Like in my group of friends, it was, what are you doing after school? Oh, I don't know, I might get a part-time job in the chip shop, you know, my mom needs an extra yeah. few bob or whatever it might, it might have been at the time. And they were real conversations that we had. Some girls went off and went to colleges of further education, but it wasn't, you know, if I had turned around and said, oh, look, I'd love to go to Trinity, they'd be like, yeah, right, look, listen to this one. Like, you know, although, like, I was, into, I, I knew that I was smart, you know, at the time. I was achieving high within my peer group, within my school, but I wasn't achieving high nationally. Um, so I suppose it's, it's identifying that potential, and it's the real need to even the playing ground when it comes to acts, fair access to education for everybody because my, my teachers were great. They had a passion to teach. They loved teaching. But for example, I wanted to study physics and we didn't have the equipment in the school. It just wasn't an option. There was two of us that wanted to study physics, so there wasn't a big enough size um, class and we just didn't have the equipment for the experiments or anything or qualified teachers to teach physics. So it just wasn't an option. So what actually happened was my bi biology teacher's son was doing a PhD in physics and he taught me and my friend um, after school on Wednesday and Friday, which we obviously had to pay for. He wouldn't do it for nothing, you know. But that was, again, me being in a privileged position to even be able to avail of that. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, I think we have to standardize That's the system on so many levels. And how much you know? work you have to do just to meet up to the, to the, to the par that other peers in a different postcode. Right, and when you look at Dublin, a map of Dublin by postcode and look at the progression rates onto third level education, like the difference the is so scary. Geographic inequality is you know, scary. It's crazy. Yeah. Any other questions we've got? Yes, can you say your name, uh, organization and uh, a question for the audience? Uh, my name is Meng Yang, I'm from the Department of Economics. Uh, thank you so much for all speakers, very, impress very impressive uh, presentation. Uh, I just have a question uh, about and the core missions of the college, so for example, for Trinity, because 
Uh, for example, one mission of the college could be prepared, uh, prepare their student for and show them how to expand their horizons and innovations, research, and cultivating maybe leading force and expert for the whole country and the whole world. And uh, on the other hand, maybe another mission of the college could be, you know, train their st student for em employment. I think that would be most uh, student or a considerable proportion of them care cares about. But I think for Trinity, it could be, you know, the top college for the Ireland. Um, so I'm very curious about what's, what do you think is the core um, responsibility of the Trinity and um, what, what do you think is more important? Because personally, I think that these could be two completely different directions. Okay, thank you so much. Well, that's a great question. I like that. That's about strategy and uh, culture and what are you training people for in Trinity? I'm just sorry you didn't ask the provost that when he opened the, the <laughs> summit, because I think he would be the person to answer and, and senior management. I mean, I've been in Trinity, what, 24 years now, uh, always in education, and I think the, there are core values that inform Trinity. I, I think there is great respect for scholarship. I think there is great trust in academics and in people working in different programs. And I know, I won't speak on behalf of TAP, but I mean, we have received enormous support from all levels of college to do this work. I think then there's, there's the other public image of Trinity, which is not maybe more that um, it's elitist, that um, all of these kind of things. But I think when you go inside and when you work from the inside, I don't think that actually is the reality. Um, and I do think there is a consciousness that there needs to be proper social outreach and that isn't tokenism. And I think the kind of support we receive in Trinity shows that certainly at that level it's not tokenistic. Um, but you have a system in Ireland, you have an education system that I think is very skewed, uh, that's very unbalanced because of a leaving certificate program that's geared for entry to university. Um, and I think we'd be far better off if universities devised their own entry systems um, and worked in a, in a much more cohesive way uh, in terms of trying to... Yeah develop all kinds of pathways. And can I maybe just add to that in the fact that there needs to be a TAP or a Centre for Intellectual Disabilities program is um, a damning indictment of our current, you know, process. You know, the fact that we need these programs is in itself, I'm going to say it, pathetic. You know, why, why we need to herald programs when in fact that should be the default? Am I, am I off the wall here? No, no. I, I mean, I think the whole area of inclusive education has, has kind of developed but it's kind of, um, there are a lot of political interests in any education system. Anyone who thinks education isn't intensely political, it is. And there are a lot of, a lot of vested interests who don't want to see any change uh, because it suits them. But, uh, I mean, I've been involved in a conference down in the Burns School of Art, and young people have been centrally involved in that. And in all their discussions, they say, what they, what they would love is the Leaving Cert to be abolished. These are even people that are doing really well from it because of the stress, because of the strain. And I think we have it within our own capacity as a nation now. And I mean, I think people all today have been talking about this and, and how we are radically changed as a people to trust ourselves to devise systems that are inclusive and not to worry about whoever games the system. This is the terror somebody's going to game the system, they'll do it anyway. But why not set up systems that suit the 95% rather than the 5% who are going to game it anyway? It's interesting, yeah. No, I think we're going to, as happens with any conversation in education, we can end up slipping into primary schools and leaving certs and all the rest of it. Uh, Hugo, are you going to say something? Yeah, I think, you know, it's just been so exciting sort of recently. I mean, this has been, this DCP ID has been going on for a number of years and the people who put the foundations a number of years. 
But we're getting to the stage that we've nearly got pretty much all our sort of, through the great work of Marie and the, with the business partners, we've nearly placed everybody. We're on the path to make it self-funding with the support from the business partners. We've seen the model works. It really works for, here's the example, you know, absolute example, the model works. And so, but we're only dealing with a tiny fraction at the moment. And I think this is what we're all sort of excited at the moment, saying what's the best way to, you know, to bring this forward? What's the best way to move it from that 84 to a number that's much larger? And that's going to involve bringing in the other uni and the universities, helping them, inspiring them. That's going to help. We're doing the job for the Department of Education and other departments as well. There's a sort of the great thing here is there's a great confluence of interests in, in, in the aims of whether it's the Department of Health, the Department of ed Education first, or Health, Social Welfare and Protection. When we, when we sat down and kind of looked at this, there really was a, we are, the, the TCPID and the wider aspect of the tab, you take the aims and strategic goals of all these government departments, we're ticking all those boxes and, and, and helping. And so the, our, the question is, how do, we, how do we help more? How do we help more students? Um, and that's the challenge, but it's incredibly exciting because we know we have the model that make can work. Okay, so we're coming into the last bit. I'm just gonna bring it back to the, to the panel, if that's okay. A call to action, an observation, something you've been thinking about, just something you wanna say. Uh, leave our audience, who are fairly diverse and interested in your opinions, would, with something that is uh, next steps, the future, it can be personal. Uh, give us a sense of what's happening for the organization or for yourselves. And debate amongst it amongst yourselves. I know who's going to go first. I'm joking. <laughs> I was going to say, I think we all need to go see Man United together. Um, um, where to begin? I think that beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know, there are opportunities um, that, you know, have been presented to us today, both to grow what TAP and TCPD are doing nationally, and then to take those further afield. And we can do that. We've seen how by setting targets internally in Trinity, we can move from three students to 3,000 students, you know, where we literally sent tar set targets where we would achieve 25% of the undergraduate student body. And there's no reason why the same can't be said for the 50,000, 57,000 people that are living with intellectual disabilities and making, you know, making sure that we really uh, approach that challenge head on. So I think um, it's not turning our eyes away from the challenges, but facing them, you know, you know, squaring them up in the eye and facing them directly. Just be very careful. You do what you can do. That's the, that's the thing. Yeah. All right. I've um, been forced to do this, so I like, yeah. <laughs> um, Bullying, I love it. <laughs> Hot potato. Well, first of all, as a student with a disability, I would like to say thanks to the TCPUTAD, because I wouldn't be anywhere without the work they're doing there. And also to the support of my colleagues who come along to support me this evening, or today, yeah, <laughs> um, from EY. Um, it's a very great supportive environment there, and I love it. Fantastic. I really appreciate it. Yes, Michael. Yeah, I just think I, I would leave here with a great sense of hope. Um, I think we can all critique all the systems, and, and that has to happen at some stage, but uh, I think there are a lot of good people in the room, and um, I think that's what gives me great hope when I see what people can achieve when we sort of forget about the assumptions and the presumptions about people and their ability levels or who they are and what they are, and really focus on who they are in terms of what they bring to the whole party. And I think it can be a great party. <laughs> Just the last thing I'd say on two examples, two things last week that Marie and I were at, where, like Stephen, two of our, our graduates, um, Van at Avalon, the aircraft leasing company, giving her final presentation, there was a bunch of all her peers that she had got to know who worked with her, so supportive, so backing, so proud of her working. And, you know, a couple of days previously, we'd been with Kieran Biddulph down at KPMG, well, the whole team of people sort of came out to watch his presentation, to encourage him and to support him. And you kind of said, this is what it should be like. This is what it should be like for not just them, 
not just seem, but for so more. And, and I think that what's the exciting thing is we know the model works, and the question now is for us to make the most of it, while not at all compromising on the quality of, of what's been delivered today. Fantastic. It's very exciting. Deirdre? Last word. Yeah, I guess to echo what most people have said, um, and then just to say, maybe we could all, now that we're in this kind of privileged position that we're all in, to always think about a plus one. So there's always, like, it's great that we can connect and um, create opportunity for people within our social circle and within our network, but to think about this plus one. So for everybody who you help out that you have an emotional connection to already, try and think about reaching out to somebody outside of that circle to bring them in to, to increase that social mobility and I think we'll be contributing to a more inclusive society then.